Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu is unwavering in his message to the U.S. Rafa is the key to victory in the war against Hamas. On Israel's northern border, the fight against Hezbollah in Lebanon is heating up. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pushed back on the Biden administration's red lines on Rafa. Netanyahu told President Biden Israel has to invade to destroy the last remaining Hamas battalions and leadership. We see no way to eliminate Hamas militarily without destroying these remaining battalions. We're determined to do it. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is repeating what the Biden administration often asserts. We acknowledge from the very beginning that Israel has a fundamental right to be able to defend itself. But we also recognize the importance of ensuring that people remain safe in Gaza. Netanyahu says the Biden administration ignores that Israel has every intention of watching out for Gaza's civilians. We, of course, share in this desire to allow an orderly exit of the population and provide aid to the civilian population. We've been doing this since the beginning of the war. Cabinet ministers Ron Dermer and Zaki Hanegbi are heading to Washington to discuss its military operation and strategy to protect Gazans in Rafah. The State Department says the people of Rafah are desperate. We need to redouble our efforts to ensure that aid can get to the places that it needs to go. But Israel asserts the UN and other agencies are not getting the food where it needs to go. These videos, reportedly from a market in Rafah, show some international aid supplies up for sale. Many suspect Hamas is stealing the supplies and profiting from their sale. The IDF announced the killing of dozens of Hamas terrorists at the Al Shifa hospital, with dozens more who have surrendered. IDF chief spokesman Daniel Hagari said Hamas used the hospital as a base of terror operations. The Hamas terrorist organization continues to systematically operate from hospitals and civilian infrastructure and exploits civilians and patients as human shields. The military also uncovered weapons in the office of the hospital director. On the northern border, Israel continues to strike Hezbollah targets in South Lebanon. CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas reported from this Hezbollah stronghold. Israel estimates that in five months of uh, almost daily border skirmishes behind me, the IDF has managed to uh, kill more than 150 Hezbollah operatives, including five high-ranking commanders. And all along the Israel-South Lebanon border, uh, Israel has managed to destroy about 150 uh, Hezbollah outposts. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken heads to the Middle East today to continue to push for a ceasefire and hostage deal. And in the U.S. Congress, Reuters reports lawmakers agreed to suspend funding for UNRWA for another year, pending an investigation into allegations that employees of the U.N. agency took part in the October 7th attack. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, I wish they would go a step further and say uh, uh, UNRWA, UNRWA shouldn't exist anymore. Uh, it's the longest sort of independent refugee agency created by the UN. It's a special one. It's completely separate from their other refugee agencies, which always have a limited time for that relief. And, and when you look at how the relief was misused, that all of that money went into these tunnels, went into supplying uh, Hamas and, and waging war against Israel. Uh, it just calls into question, why in the world are we doing it? If the people of Gaza don't want to create their own city, if they don't want to invest in their own infrastructure, if they don't want to invest in their own farms, uh, water pur purification, electrical grid, all of these things that are necessary f for modern cities, if they would rather have all that money go into terror tunnels, well, then we need to shut off the money going to them. And I wish that we would have the political backbone to do it. At the same time, you have a huge population here, and they're all at risk in this horrible war. Let us continue to put pressure on Hamas. That's the key. If Hamas will release the, the hostages, if they will 
unconditionally surrender and turn over that area to the IDF, well, then you can have peace. But until that time, there will be no peace. In other news, just hours after the Supreme Court gave the go-ahead to a Texas immigration law, an appeals court put on the brakes. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon, and it's all about the border. A Texas law allowing state officials to bypass the federal government to enforce its own border policies is at the center of the legal battle. CBN's Wendy Griffith reports. Whiplash on the southern border. Just as Texas was about to start enforcing its own border law after the Supreme Court gave the go-ahead, a federal appeals court slapped on another stay overnight. The law allows Texas law enforcement to arrest and jail people suspected of coming into the country illegally. It also gives judges authority to deport some of them. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court lifted a stay on enforcing the law, while a lower court decides the case on its merits. Within hours, the Fifth Circuit Court once again put the law on hold. Speaking before the lower court ruling, Texas Governor Abbott said the Supreme Court's decision was encouraging because it means the court could eventually rule in their favor. What it signals is there are six votes on the Supreme Court that say it's okay for Texas to go ahead and, and begin enforcing the law. And, and so that's a very consequential step that's been taken. It's not conclusive, but it's consequential for now. The Biden administration calls the law unconstitutional. Immigration experts say it could set a bad precedent. Essentially, now every state is going to have the, the green light um, to go ahead and set up whatever kind of immigration system they want, if, if, even if it conflicts with uh, federal law. Uh, we don't like this category. We don't like this group. Um, we can charge you as a criminal and, and order you deported. Meanwhile, an estimated 3 million migrants have crossed the border illegally under the Biden administration, a crisis that some say can only be solved with the help of God. We've tried politics, we've tried uh, protesting, we've tried advocating. Now we're going to go back to what we know works, which is prayer, fasting, coming before God, and just knowing that he, he really is the only hope that our nation and our southern border has. Reverend Tony Suarez says revival on the border is heating up, and he's scheduled evangelistic events and prayer stops in several border cities over the next few weeks. He's the second evangelist to visit the border this month, following Franklin Graham's Frontier Tour a few weeks ago. For now, Texas hands are tied in their battle over the border crisis. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals will hear arguments on the case today and is expected to end up back at the Supreme Court. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. All right, thank you, Wendy. Well, back here in Washington, the top general laid the blame for the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan on the Biden administration. In August 2021, thousands of Afghans and Americans desperate to flee the Taliban sought to escape on U.S. military flights. Thirteen U.S. service members died in a suicide bombing as they provided security at Kabul's main airport. Retired General Mark Milley told the House Foreign Affairs Committee the State Department waited too long to order the evacuation. The call to execute the NEO came too late, um, and as uh, General McKenzie mentioned, it was officially logged in on the 14th. At that point in time, the Afghan government senior leadership was preparing to depart, and they departed the next day on the 15th. Uh, the uh, thousands of Afghan civilians were gathering at the airport. Uh, the Afghan security forces were collapsing in the various provincial capitals. And Former General Milley also testified that the administration did not approve a request for more troops. Well, turning to the war in Ukraine, after the Russian invasion a little more than two years ago, nearly a million Ukrainians headed to the tiny country of Moldova. Today, more than 100,000 remain. Just days ago, on his way to the Middle East, CBN International correspondent George Thomas paid a visit to Moldova's capital to bring us this report. April will mark two years since Irina Mishina escaped from Ukraine's Donetsk region. I miss home, my work. My son used to be in school. My mom used to have work. Since then, Irina, her mom, 15-year-old son, and the family cat have lived in this one-bedroom apartment on the outskirts of Moldova's capital city. 
We cannot go to Donetsk region right now because there is a war. It is impossible to live there. There is no electricity, no water. And she also worries about her husband, Daniel, who remains back home, still serving on the front lines. It's awful when we don't hear from him. I remember for one week we had no communication. Twice a week, she and her mother travel for hours on a bus to this church for fellowship with other Ukrainian women stuck in Moldova, whose husbands also fight for the homeland. It is a wonderful time. We can feel the support. Even when I talk about it, I get goosebumps. Leading the group, Ina Tokarchuk with Mission Eurasia, a Christian organization serving 13 countries of the former Soviet Union and Poland. I'm serving people who have experienced war, who have lost their homes and maybe their loved ones, and have to, for the last two years, been forced to live in a different country in hard conditions. Tukarchuk says she's ministered to at least 10,000 people through these group counseling sessions, mostly women and children. Every one of our meetings begins with fellowship and ends with a message from God's Word. My goal is to share what the Bible says relating to their situation. I want them to know who this Jesus is and how His Word can be made applicable in their daily lives. Mission Eurasia also holds outreach activities for Ukrainian children living in Moldova. Many, like Ina Ruptanova's five-year-old son, having to make new friends in their new land. All his friends are spread all across Ukraine and the entire world. And here tonight, he's finding new friends. That's why it's so important to participate in these kinds of events. More than two years after war started in Ukraine, Mission Eurasia here in neighboring Moldova has ministered to over 60,000 Ukrainian refugees, meeting their physical, emotional and spiritual needs. Alexander Belev, a local Moldovan pastor, also serves as Mission Eurasia's executive director for field missions. With war raging less than 100 miles away, Belev says his country continues to feel the effects of the conflict. Pray for us so that we can maintain the desire to minister and that people would have compassion and will share what they have with others and fulfill the scripture that says to take care of orphans, widows and those who are oppressed. George Thomas, CBN News, Chisinau, Moldova. Thank you, George. Ministry even in the time of war. Gordon? I want to pay special attention to that request for prayer. Prayer that, that we wouldn't grow weary in doing good. good. When you're in a wartime situation, uh, when you see lawlessness all around you, when you see the heartache of all these refugees, it's very easy for your compassion to grow cold. Today we call it compassion fatigue. But this is what Christians do. In the middle of the worst circumstances, we reach out with the love of Christ. We help widows and orphans. We help refugees. We help people in need and we continue to preach the good news. If we do not grow weary doing good, we will reap a great harvest. So let's pray for the people there in Moldova, but let's also pray for the people in America that our love would not grow cold, that we need to be a shining light now more than ever to all the nations of the world. Uh, that city of a hill that we've claim for centuries. Can we, can we fulfill that dream, that vision of our ancestors? Here is what happens when you have liberty, you have freedom, you have freedom of religion, and we want to show people this is what can happen if you do this, and we want to care for people. That's part of being a Christian. So let's love one another, and let's love the stranger, uh, let's love the foreigner, let's love people who are in desperate need. Well, for many voters, the crisis on our southern border is their number one political issue. While lawmakers in Washington are struggling to find solutions, one group of Christian women is making trips to the border to pray for migrants and patrol agents. Charlene Aaron brings us their story. A new LifeWay study found that 91% of evangelicals favor immigration legislation that guarantees tighter borders. That same number also supports immigration measures that respect the God-given dignity of every person. The group Women of Welcome is doing just that, approaching the issue from a biblical stance 
not a political one. I've been working in the pro-life movement really for pre-born lives and kids who are trapped in foster care or were awaiting forever families. And I was just challenged by a friend who worked really in the immigration space with World Relief to say, hey, does your pro-life agenda, does your pro-life biblical worldview extend to those across the border? For Women of Welcome's Bree Stensrud, who leads a community of more than 13,000 evangelical Christian women, that answer was no. A trip to the U.S.-Mexico border in 2019 changed both her mind and heart. I met with vulnerable mothers and migrant children who were also mothers themselves due to the violence that had happened to them in their countries. And they were seeking safety. They were seeking a different life. And that wasn't the narrative that I was hearing. It wasn't the narrative that um, my other friends in my conservative Christian circles were hearing either. And so it really grieved me because I thought if my girlfriends could see what I've seen on the other side of the border, they would be just as grieved too. I would want to say to another mother who was a seeking asylum that I'm so sorry. <sighs> and also that you are doing a great job and that all the little things you do for your kid, that all those little things matter. It is a sentiment Stensrud believes other Christian women would likely openly share, were it not for partisan politics. It's very hard to detangle and let yourself sit back a ways to take in the full picture. Because right now, each party is being fed a certain narrative about what should be happening along the border. We should be seeing what's happening at the border as an opportunity, a gospel opportunity, an eternity kingdom possibility. That possibility turns into reality during her group's trips to the border. Opportunities to pray for migrants and Border Patrol agents abound, with officers seeking prayer for rising suicide rates among their ranks, safety concerns, and help with their families. Every officer has always accepted our prayer, and uh, we, we huddle them up in a circle, we lay our hands on them, and we thank them for showing up in some of the hardest parts of humanity mm -hmm. and trying to affirm people's dignity as they are approached by them. While Stinsroot points out their work is not politically motivated, she admits disappointment that lawmakers have failed to make progress. There are just, you know, really some detractors that are showing up and persuading people otherwise. And Americans in general, but conservative Christians, they want a solution for vulnerable people showing up at our border and vulnerable people around the globe. We want to see people work together for the flourishing of people, no matter what party you're, you're siding with on any given year. Meanwhile, as the nation grapples with the issue, the Bible calls Stensrud and others to take the lead. It doesn't mean that everybody gets into the U.S. We, we have to have thorough vetting, and the Lord is going to hold us accountable to how we treat the sojourner. You don't have to leave conviction to have compassion. And just come in and see what the Lord says in the whole arc of Scripture, and let that inform the ways that you show up politically to make a solution for thousands and thousands of people and Americans alike. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Is the verse in 1 John 3. I think as a church, I think our call is to, is to get closer. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, it's unfortunate a humanitarian crisis has become such a highly charged political issue. And there are problems on both sides of the aisle. I'll, I'll just point out two major ones. Uh, Attorney General S Jeff Sessions uh, establishing a rule that migrant children are, are separated from their parents uh, at the border. That was absolutely inhumane. I, I don't see how you can possibly defend that. On the other side, uh, with the Biden administration uh, seeming to ignore that there was a border crisis and that millions of people were, were crossing and that was going to have unbelievable consequences for every major city in, in America. And so now you're seeing the Democrat mayors of New York and Chicago criticizing their own party and their own administration and their own policy. And what he did was essentially say, I'm, I'm not going to enforce the border laws. That, that got around the world. People as far away as, 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 as Afghanistan are saying, uh, well, let's go to America and let's go to the land of milk and honey. Let, uh, let's get out of these horrible situations. And so whether it's a hot spot in Africa, a hot spot in the Middle East, uh, Venezuela, 
we're seeing a flood come in, and literally we can't support it. Uh, our systems aren't built for it. So, Ashley, what should Christians do? I mean, I definitely commend the women of Welcome. I absolutely love what they're doing. And I love what she said. You don't have to leave your conviction to have compassion. And I think that's important. No matter where you're at on the political aisle, to remember, you know, as Christians, we're called to be compassionate and to love our neighbor, love the immigrant, love the stranger. So. And what I would love to see coming out of any administration is can we have a plan of how do we provide for them in their home countries mm. uh, so that they don't have to flee? Uh, that's a much bigger issue, and, and it's unfortunate. We had a story earlier about pulling out from Afghanistan. It's unfortunate what's happening there. It's unfortunate what happened in Venezuela. It, it's an absolute humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, but just in, in Mexico, how can we make sure that they have uh, what they need and can have a hope in a future. I mean, that's right in our own backyard. So, um, you know, can we take it a piece at a time? But you, from my standpoint, you have to enforce the borders. Uh, you can't just have open borders where people can cross in. Uh, it's going to lead to chaos, and we're already seeing it. Yeah, just a good reminder. Let's have compassion, everyone. Kayla Kraft is an entrepreneur with a goal to help one million women make more than $1 million a year. And she's well on her way with her Mommy Millionaire podcast, live events, coaching programs, and social media. Self-made millionaire, author and entrepreneur Kayla Kraft was working as an ER nurse when she realized she wanted more. I'm never gonna get ahead financially living like this and I feel so unappreciated, overworked. I have to make a change. In her book, What Do You Really Want? Kayla shares the Take 7 approach to help you transform your life and become the person God intended you to be. All right. Well, we are so excited to have Kayla Kraft live on the 700 Club. Welcome to the program. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, we're so excited to have you. Okay, so let's get into your story. Mm -hmm. So you were an ER nurse for several years, and you actually became an ER nurse pretty young, right? Right, yeah. How old were you? Well, I remember being 13 years old and deciding I okay. wanted to be an ER wow. nurse. So I knew at a very young age yeah. that's what I wanted to do. Absolutely. And so by the time I was 21, I was an, I was an ER nurse. Okay, so yeah. what happened on your lunch break <laughs> that was like honestly life-changing? <laughs> Tell us about that. It's such a funny story because actually my boss wrote me up that day because I was eating a bean burrito at the nurse's station because wow. I was starving. I was pregnant with my second child. Mm -hmm. And I actually loved that boss. Like she saw leadership in me and she made me a charge nurse. Uh -huh. But just getting written up for eating a I was like, why am I doing this? Mm. You know, there has to be more to life than mm. this for me. And I really wanted to figure out a way to be home with my second child, right? And yeah. have a different just lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started to just be more interested in other opportunities for myself. And I tried some other things out, but I ultimately found network marketing and that really changed my life. Yeah, how did it change your life? I mean, tell us tell us <laughs> that whole journey. So I, I like to share the story that it was on Facebook okay. before, like you remember on Facebook when you had to have a school email address to start it? Like, yes. so it was that long yeah. ago, okay? <laughs> and I have always had the personality of just being very blunt I just kind of tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was doing on Facebook in the status updates. Mm -hmm. And little did I know I was becoming an influencer at that oh, time. Wow. Yeah. Right. And so when I shared things, people would buy it. And I was sharing about health and wellness supplements mm -hmm. and a lot of people bought it. That's the simplest way to say it. So by the time yeah. I was 26, I found myself a millionaire, wow. first millionaire in my family. Crazy. Wow. I was raised by a single mom, you know, with my dad in jail. Okay. So you know, I beat the statistics, but really like when people ask, you know, how, how did you do it? I'm like, this was totally God's plan because yeah. he always had me in the right place at the right time, mm. you know? And so I know there's probably people listening in right now that think, oh, why do I have to go through this hard stuff? Mm -hmm. But God will always make your mess, his message. Come on. And you know, so yeah. that's really, I remember at 26 going, okay, it's not about the money. It's really about the platform mm. that God's given me. And so I just always wanted to shine bright for God. 
Absolutely, and you definitely are doing that. And in the book, uh, What Do You Really Want? Seven questions that can unlock the answers to a life full of abundance, meaning, and connection. You talk about little me mm -hmm. and how all of us are affected by maybe some childhood traumas, traumas, and what were some of those things that you yourself had to overcome in life? Oh, man. Well, you know, my dad first went to jail when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. So just being abandoned by the, there's two people in your life that you're supposed to count on, your mom and your dad. So being abandoned by one of them, you know, at such an early age mm -hmm. was very traumatic. You know, because yeah. I'm like, oh, don't, does he not love me enough? I didn't realize at the time that addiction is a disease. Yeah. And so that was really hurtful because I grew up basically always feeling rejected, not just by him, but by everybody. That was my lens, my view of life. And so uh, it was helpful because in sales, I didn't care when people told me no. I was like, on to the next one. Let's go. Let's sell some more. Yeah. But then when you're you know, almost 30 years old, you're like, okay, like, I don't want to keep going at the same pace. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's when I started to learn about this inner child work. And I always thought it was kind of woo-woo. I was like, okay, yeah. no, is this Christian? You know, like, <laughs> does God want us to do this? Yeah. But really what it helped me do was honor those past versions of myself and have more mm -hmm. like love mm -hmm. and adoration because right. God looks at our sins and he says, sin, like, he, he doesn't remember the sins. Like, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as we ask for forgiveness, those are gone. He doesn't keep bringing it up and up and up. And so uh, I really, really, really just like <laughs> uh, decided to love all those past versions of me mm -hmm. and say, okay, God, like I give you all the glory in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I want to shine as my champion self. I talk about that in the book, yeah. being your champion self. That's how mm -hmm. God designed us to be, yeah. is to show up and really look at ourselves like we were made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. So if we truly believe that we were made in the image of God, every single one of us yeah. would walk around with a little more pep in our step. We would walk into every room and say, how can I make this room better? You know, how can I make every interaction I have with somebody, they felt the Holy Spirit right there, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's what I hope the book does for people is they start yeah. like living on purpose, like Amen. stop going through the motions, mm -hmm. realize like you're made on a purpose and people go, what's my purpose? And I say, it's to love God with all your heart, yes. right? And so yeah. we move differently when we love God with all yeah. of our heart and to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. So how are we doing that? You know, like yeah. that we can all be living on purpose every single day. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that because I think a lot of people don't understand that. You know, sometimes our past and the traumas from our childhood, our traumas from our past mm -hmm. can affect the future and it's in, in the present as well. And it's so important to seek out healing. And so I'm so happy that you share that in your book and you're really open about that. But I got to talk about Mommy Millionaire. Okay. <laughs> how did you even develop this podcast? What led you to, to do these programs, podcasts, all the things? Well, I found myself right as a millionaire and I go, well, I'm not happy. I, I was truly like the, mm. I, I wasn't happy, but when I was happiest, I was helping other people. And wow. so I knew I wanted to help people and uh, everybody around me like seemed to become successful after they worked with me and I would coach them through some of their hardships mm -hmm. and their lives. And so I was like, how can I put this into a method that every single person can pick up in a book and start to get what they want in life, yeah. you know? Because if we're made in God's image, we're made to be victorious. Mm -hmm. We're made to win. Christians are made to win. And there's too many losing. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, gosh, let's get this take seven in their hands so they can start being victorious. Take seven. So there's seven practices that you talk about in the book. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe what's like one or two. Well, okay. So it's funny. This is step six. What do you really want okay. is actually step six uh -huh. of take seven. But the first question I always start with is what's not working for you in your life? Mm. People are really good at sharing what's not working, but my rule around this is you, if you state the complaint, you've got to be willing to do something yes, about it. Yes, you got to do something. Right? So it's <laughs> like when you go to a restaurant and you order a steak and you go, I want the steak to be well done. Uh -huh. And then you get it and it's medium rare. You're like sending the thing back. <laughs> That's how we should be with our lives. It's wow. like, oh wait, I didn't order this. I need something different. Mm -hmm. So, all right, then we move on to some more practices that are going to start helping you mm. take different actions start networking with different people to start getting what you really want. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, Kayla, I feel like we could talk for hours. We really <laughs> could, but thank you. We just skimmed the surface of your book. I just want to thank you for everything that you're doing, and I'm so excited for this. Yes. And I just want to let everyone know Kayla's book is called What Do You Really Want? And it's available nationwide. Highly recommend you guys get your hands on it. Thank you so much, Kayla. Thank you. Yeah.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. With violence gripping Haiti, group aid groups rather are warning of the risk of starvation. About 1.4 million people are on the verge of famine, and another 4 million need help getting food. That's according to a report some, from some 15 global organizations and charities. Gangs virtually control the capital, Port-au-Prince, and the government has collapsed. The United States has told Americans in the country to be ready to make their way to the embassy for evacuation. We're well, looking now to the 2024 elections and the hot button topic of abortion. Former President Donald Trump appeared to suggest he might support a national ban of around 15 weeks of pregnancy. Trump takes credit for the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade after appointing three conservative justices who voted against it. That's led to a state-by-state -state battle over abortion restrictions and some calls for a federal ban. The Associated Press reports in a recent radio interview, Trump noted that many are agreeing on a 15-week ban, and he added that he's thinking in terms of that. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Zafan had a one-in-a-million condition. The blood vessels in his heart and lungs were in the wrong position. Doctors said he'd suffocate as soon as he was born. Well, Zavon's parents worried they'd have to bring him home in a coffin. But today, thanks to you, he's thriving. Shortly after the Ma's married, they decided to start a family. They couldn't have been happier until they found out that their son Zafon would be born with a rare heart disease. The doctor said only one in a million babies have it. The blood vessels in Zifan's heart and lungs were in the wrong position, and he wouldn't be able to breathe after he was born. He suffocated. I was overwhelmed. The doctors suggested that we not have Zifan, but I remember an ultrasound where I heard his heartbeat, and when he kicked, it seemed he was telling me, Mom, I'm strong. You should be strong, too. Mr. Ma started working a second job to try to save money for surgery. Mrs. Ma sold her wedding bracelet. It was the most valuable thing I had, but my baby was more important, so I gave it up. Mrs. Ma often checked to see if there was movement in her womb. One night, I had a nightmare that he was stillborn, and I woke up crying and sweating. As Zifon's due date approached, the couple still didn't have enough for surgery. She wouldn't have a chance at life. Instead of celebrating his birth, we'd have to take his little body home, buy a coffin, and have a funeral. Around this time, the Ma's met a woman who told them about Operation Blessing. The couple contacted us, and we said we'd help make it possible for Zifon to get surgery. The Ma's are Muslims and were surprised by the news. I didn't expect a Christian lady who was completely different from us to help, but she was very warm-hearted. I touched my belly and told my baby, you are going to make it. Some kind people are going to help us. Soon after Zifan was born, we made sure he got surgery. Look how happy he is. His heart is healthy. He breathes well and can climb. He's energetic and fast, and I enjoy every minute with him. He's lively and likes to laugh. Without your help, we would have lost our baby. Whenever I hear my son's heartbeat, I think of Operation Blessing. I think of your love. You've given my son and our family a bright future. And thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club, so thank you. Because of you, that little boy has got a life. He's got a hope. He's got a future. You can be a part of so many different things that we do all around the world. You can be a part of helping people with special surgeries, drilling water wells and water systems so that people can have fresh water, livelihood programs, disaster relief, relief to those who have evacuated, uh, whether it's from Ukraine or within Israel. We're doing it all in your name when you're a member of the 700 Club. 
If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. If you are a member, I invite you to increase. How much is it to be a member? Well, it's $20 a month. Some can give higher levels. We've got 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year, and that's $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, and we can send as our gift to you Power for Life month monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the Internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. You can also text to give. Uh, you can text the letter CBN to 71777. Either way, do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. On life support in a medically induced coma, LaTanya was going downhill fast. Then she coded. And what happened next can only be described as miraculous. When I heard the physician tell my parents that it doesn't look good and to pray for a miracle, I knew then that I was in for the fight of my life. It had been three days since LaTanya Faison was diagnosed with shingles. Now the 45-year-old was in a hospital bed with kidney and acute liver failure. Without a transplant, she would die. But finding a donor in time would not be easy. Executive Medical Director for the University of North Carolina Hospital in Chapel Hill, Dr. Shirag Desai explains. Thousands of the patients who are on the waiting list and only 50% end up getting a liver transplant usually. Uh, within the one year or so. We can say that it may be just a 10% chances of the survival within the next 30 to 90 days for her without a transplant. Her parents and other family members were with her when she got the news and were asking God for a miracle. I was so ill and so, so sick that I couldn't, I couldn't verbally pray for myself. So I guess that's when God came in and looked at my heart and knew that I needed help, I needed prayer. Soon after, doctors put LaTanya on life support in a medically induced coma. They also put her on the donor wait list for a liver and a kidney. LaTanya's daughter, Morgan, who was 12 at the time, remembers seeing her mother. She had a bunch of tubes coming everywhere, bags coming out of her, and it was just terrible to see her like that. I've never seen her like that. I've never seen her sick like that, and it was very scary. But my prayers were that she sees me graduate, after 20 days, LaTanya was brought out of the coma with no improvement. By now, 80% of her kidney function was lost, and she was placed on dialysis three days a week. Both organs were failing, uh, liver and the kidney, and typically that happens when the patient gets the acute liver failure, then other systems in the body also starts reacting. Then it got worse. LaTanya developed sepsis, was hemorrhaging, and had fluid in both lungs. Then one day she coded. Even in her comatose state, LaTanya remembers. The monitor started frantically going off. I could feel myself being lifted out of my body, hovering over my body, and looking down at my body on the hospital bed. I heard my mother saying, oh my gosh, no, Tanya, please don't go, don't go. And I remember being in a place that was so beautiful and the peace that surrounded me surpassed any type of peace that I could have ever experienced here on earth. I had no worries, I had no cares. I just felt an abounding love. And I heard in the background, I could hear a voice say, it's not your time yet, you have to go back. And at that moment, I, I transitioned back to my body. Then, a heartbeat. Many patients don't survive this code, especially when they are sick with the other disorders. So it's a miracle that she pulled out through this code. The family and countless others continue to pray. Then, a miracle. LaTanya went from the bottom of the national donor list to the top, and within two weeks, a matching donor was found for her liver and kidney. Before her surgery, LaTanya had a specific prayer for God. I've got a daughter that, that needs me. She needs me and I'm just praying that you can get me through the surgery successfully with no complications. God kept speaking to me, speaking to me and telling me that everything would be just fine. On January 11, 2017, LaTanya's team of doctors began the 13-hour surgery to replace her kidney and liver. 
you know this new organs are like miracles so she she received both those organs she was in the icu she did very well i was very thankful trust me i wanted to run and jump on her and give her a hug but when she came out she was very weak but i was very thankful after four weeks of rehabilitation including anti-rejection medications and continued dialysis Latanya's kidney and liver were working as expected. She was released from the hospital on February 8, 2017, on her 46th birthday. The only danger now was whether her body would reject her new organs. My prayer to God was that my organs wouldn't reject, my body, you know, wouldn't reject these organs, and that, that God would keep me healthy so that I can be here to at least see my daughter graduate from high school and off to college. Six years later, through prayer and the unselfish generosity of others, those prayers were answered. I'm so thankful for the donor and their family because my mom, she was able to see me graduate from high school and in three more years, she will see me graduating from college with a master's degree in psychology. It doesn't look like she had a double transplant and those prayers definitely had something to do with it. Dr. Desai agrees. Uh, she's doing extremely well. You know, your outcome is between uh, you and the donor who donated. So they need to cherish this and thank God for this. Latanya continues rehab therapy and her anti-rejection medications. She's still going strong. Prayer is powerful, and prayer is what kept me here and is keeping me going. But I can say to others who, are, who may be going through a crisis, always keep the faith. Don't give up. God can do all things. Amen and amen. Always keep the faith and don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop asking. Don't stop believing that anything is possible for our Heavenly Father who sits on the throne. He is on the throne, ruling and reigning over the world ruling and reigning over your life. I just believe, I want to encourage you today, God came through for Latanya. And we believe and are going to have faith and have faith right now that God is going to come through for you today, right now. Just in a moment, we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to move in a way that only he can move. And I just pray and hope that Latanya's healing testimony encourages you to keep asking keep praying and keep believing. We've got some more answer to prayer. This is a, mer a miracle. Jorge uh, started having excruciating, sharp, paralyzing pain on his left leg to his kneecap. It was as if someone stuck a knife in his leg and moved it around. He went to the doctor and was diagnosed with spinal stenosis. He was watching the 700 Club when Gordon gave this word of knowledge. Someone has an extreme pain in the left knee, like a dagger into your kneecap. God is healing that. And you just felt sort of warm and cold at the same time. You are pain-free, completely restored. Give praise to God. And later, myself said, if you have spinal stenosis, God is healing that right now. Jorge received both words of knowledge and is now totally healed. To God be the glory. Yes and amen. To God be the glory. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love it when the words are so accurate mm -hmm. that you just go, yay, God. Yeah. Here's Eileen. Uh, Ashley gave a word of knowledge about someone who had problems with the back of their gums. It was painful, so I took the word for myself. In a few days, the pain and the tears were completely gone. God is so good. The key to, to miracles is to take it for yourself. Just what Eileen said, I, I took it for myself. I, I took the word for myself. What, what does God want us to do? do? Does he want us to come and, and beg and plead with him and, and, and give our argument about how he should heal us because we're going to do good things in our life or we're going to care for our children or our grandchildren or uh, there's so many things that we, we can do here on earth. I don't think any of that works. But what does work is when you believe what he has already done. People ask Jesus, what does God want us to do? And his answer is, is so wonderful. God wants you to believe in the one that he sent. And when you do that, when you say, okay, I believe in Jesus, I believe in everything he was sent to do. I believe it's part of his very essence. It's part of his mission. This is what he wanted to do. For God so loved the world, that's me. He wanted to do this. He sent his only begotten son. Now, 
All I have to do is enter into that and, and say, yes, that's for me. Jesus is for me. He came to heal. That's for me. He came to save. That's for me. He came to deliver. That's for me. He came to forgive. That's for me. He wants me to have an abundant life. That's for me. He wants me to prosper just as my soul prospers. That's for me. All of those things, just take it and say, I believe that. I believe the message. I believe Jesus. I believe in what God does. He wants it all for me. And when you do, you enter into some wonderful miracle power and you're enabled to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there's nobody sick. That's God's will. Let's pray it down. Let's believe it down and it will happen for you. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we just ask that your will would be done in bodies today. We know in heaven there's no one sick, there's no one depressed, there's no one with mental illness, there's no one poor, there's no one lonely, there's no one in need of deliverance. And so we ask that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Send forth your word and heal our disease. Open the eyes of our heart, our understanding. Open our ears that we can hear it and comprehend it and believe it. Give us these things, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Ashley, God's given you some. Yeah, I believe somebody's watching, and you've got some some type of an exfic... I can't even say it. Exfic wow, I cannot say it. Um, something that is preventing you from breathing. And I just believe God is healing you right now of it. And I also just, I, I just keep seeing this picture of somebody, um, there are people around you and they're laying hands on your head. And I believe it's because you've been just so severely depressed and it's just been like this cloak of sadness over you. And I just believe God is literally restoring your mental health right now in the name of Jesus. You're gonna be, begin to feel the joy of the Lord even right now in this moment. Just begin to praise him and thank him in the name of Jesus. Now, there's someone, you're in the hospital, you're suffering with sepsis, the report is not good. God's able to cleanse out all of that infection right now and restore every single organ to full function. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Kingdom of God come to you right now. He is able to resurrect you. He's able to restore you. He's able to heal all that damage now. In the name of Jesus, be healed and be made whole. We receive it now. Amen. And amen. If you've been healed, let us know. 1-800-700-7000. Uh, if you need prayer, give us a call, and we'd be glad to pray for you. All you have to do is pick up a phone. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from John. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health just as your soul prospers.